Hi everyone. Thank you for joining our ICANN 79 Community Forum Recap Webinar today. Today we have with us our Global Industry Relations Team, led by Prudence Malinke, and we have Chris Nimi with us, our Manager of Strategic Initiatives, and also Shane Lehman, who manages the Global Industry Relations here at Mark Monitor. Without further ado, we have a lot to get through today. I will go ahead and pass you off to Prudence. Thank you so much, Natalie. So we should give a shout out to Natalie, who's the voice behind all of the Mark Monitor webinars. We really appreciate what you do. And welcome everyone to the Mark Monitor GIR ICANN 79 recap. Today, we will be going through the highs and lows of the ICANN meeting. And as you can see from the agenda slide, we have an action-packed agenda for you. Um, and we'll be covering the highs and lows, missing over too much of the drama, because there was a little bit of drama, um, but it should be a really informative session. And towards the end, just to remind everyone, in order to make this webinar as useful and as beneficial to you as possible, we strongly advise that when you receive your feedback questionnaire that you give as honest a review as to what works for you and what doesn't work for you as possible so we can really tailor and structure our content to give you what you need um, and also we have really thick skin so if you don't want to hear my voice anymore it's fine i'll handle it like a pro it's okay all right, so as you can see from the agenda today, we've got so much to go over. We'll talk about the I can meet it at glance and give you some statistics and some info, but we'll also go over some of the hard hitters sessions that happened during the meeting. Uh, we had the DNS abuse amendment sessions, the GAT communicate, obviously, because the GAC matters. Uh, and then obviously RDRS, and we'll talk a lot about that as well, uh, as well as the registration data policy updates too. Um, and we'll go over also the transfer PDP updates because again, there's a really great and helpful recap as to where we are with the transfer PDP, which should be really useful and informative for you. Um, and then we're going to talk about WSIS as well. Uh, Shane will talk to you about what's happening at CCNSO with regards to WSIS too. So we've got loads of things to discuss with you today and we're really excited to have you on board with us. Uh, so let's go and have a look at the meeting at a glance. Next slide. Oh, look at our smiley faces. Okay, so uh, ICANN 79 was held in ever so sunny and ever so beautiful Puerto Rico. Uh, big shout out to Pablo. Thank you for doing such a fantastic job and you really were a wonderful host. What a fantastic ICANN. Uh, and also that was the third time that we had the ICANN meeting in Puerto Rico. Uh, and it was such a celebratory meeting, um, but also with its little bits of spice here and there, which we will allude to, but we're not going to go into because frankly, we're not that kind of people. Uh, but yes, so it was the ICANN community meeting. Uh, as you guys know, there's three formats of the meeting, policy meetings, community, community meetings, and the AGM. So at the community meetings, all elements of the community converge together and certain elements will have constituency days where they spend entire days focusing on their work and efforts and kind of informing each other of relevant and salient developments in their sector. Um, now, this meeting wasn't just well attended. As you can see, we had well over a thousand uh, in-person attendees. This was the first ICANN meeting where the traffic light system for our badges was kind of pretty much disregarded, which meant that, that's right, hugs were in. There were lots and lots of hugging all round and high fives and fist bumps. It was a very touchy-feely ICANN. Uh, but all that being said, not only was it a touchy-feely ICANN, this was the first ICANN, I think, in a very long time where not only were people actually hugging, there was not one email at all talking about COVID. We had the first ever COVID-free ICANN in a very long time, attendees. So as you can see from the slide, we did have a couple of really good high interest sessions. We had lots of guest appearances as well. The FBI were on site as well at one point, and they had their own little session. We had secret additional PPSAI meetings. This was a really action-packed session. And as I mentioned, it didn't come without its own kind of element of spice uh, and its own kind of element of uh, fun stuff that was happening. But with regards to the next meeting, we'll talk about that in our following slides, but let's just take a deep dive and I'll give you a high level overview, super high level, of the IGM EPDP and then we'll get stuck into WSIS. 
Okay, so let's talk about all things IDN EPDP. So there was a session, a couple of sessions during the ICANN meeting to do the EPDP. This meeting is actually going relatively well timing wise. It's not going uh, super bad and it doesn't have any specific areas of concern with regards to the timings of this EPDP. Um, during this ICANN meeting in Puerto Rico, this session was really focused on reviewing specific recommendations uh, that being i think it was 20 and 21 uh, as well as the implementation guideline uh, for 22 as well the sessions were very specific really focusing on idn table harmonizations um, and during the meeting it was really looking with regards to that baseline criteria for implementing idns uh, at the second level now during that meeting um, it was kind of decided that the small group at the behest of the registry groups would actually come together to further discuss those IDM table harmonizations. Um, but it's again, this group is making good progress, which is also really indicative of what's to come next with regards uh, to uh, the next round as well. All right, so less about IDN EPDPs. Let's get on and move on to the good stuff. I'll hand over to Shane, who's going to give us our CCNSO update. Shane. Thank you, Prudence. Yeah. Um, so let's let's dive into some CCNSO sessions at a glance. These are some high-level overviews of of some of the more important topics that were discussed. Uh, first being the universal acceptance. Um, universal acceptance is the way in which CCTLDs can allow for their local internet audience, if you will, to be able to see the internet web pages and social media in their own um, in their own languages. Um, so this session was an update to the CCNSO members and the broader ICANN community working to adopt strategies to ensure that local languages are, you know, accessible in all websites and social media, as mentioned. Um, moving on from that is internet fragmentation, which is a concept that the division of the internet into isolated networks. There's two different but kind of similar views on this topic. The first being, will the global internet survive in a fragmented world? And then the adverse of that is one internet without fragmentation can pose problems to cultural identities and control over information, as well as economic disadvantages to the various regions. An IGF policy network's been set up to kind of work through internet fragmentation. And the main topic that they're, they're working on or question, if you will, is, is it possible to have a unified internet when states don't cooperate? States being local governments, regional governments, stuff like that. Um, which is very interesting. We'll see, we'll see where that develops into. Um, the final session to kind of call out here is the policy gap discussion, which was held between members of IANA, the um, Association for Naming of, of TLDs. Um, and this session was really interesting because it, it brought into question where IANA can step in with regards to when a CCTLD manager resigns from their position hosting and providing for CCTLD, and there is no um, successors, being either a family member to take over the position, another person in the, in the region. Um, and basically what, what came out of it is there's no policy basis currently for IANA to decide how CCTLD managers are chosen, that being that gap in the policy currently. Next slide, please. Moving on, we'll talk about some of the more I don't know if spicy is the right word, but some of the more interesting sessions from the CCNSO side, which is the DNS Abuse Subcommittee. I'll refer to them as DAS going forward, but um, the DAS work sessions were, were really interesting, especially because it was well attended by not just members from the CCTLD community, but also the GTLD and broader ICANN community as well. Um, some main talking points from there is that CCTLD and GTLD DNS abuse should not be considered the same. CCTLDs are under no obligation to act on DNS abuse, whereas GTLD registrars are contractually required to act. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, that definition is, was made very clear by members of the community that there is a distinction between the two. Um, with that being said, also noting that registration data and DNS abuse are two separate things. There's a difference between malicious content on a site or what uh, the phishing, farming, however you wanna see that, and the actual registration data. Some domain names have been dormant for five years and then all of a sudden malicious content is spun up. That doesn't reflect on the registration data, registration data being you know, the registrant organization, those kind of items. That's more on the content actually being distributed. 
Um, the DASC is working on a balance between looking at mitigating DNS abuse before it happens with considerations for human rights impacts and, and trademark rights. Um, and one of the biggest themes is that CCTLD registries are not playing with the same set of tools. So while all, for the most part, GTLD registries and registrars have kind of stable infrastructures to work through, some CCTLD registries are smaller, less, less management, if that makes sense. Uh, maybe they're run by one or two people in the region. Um, so they do not have the same resources available that other registries have to combat DNS abuse. Uh, that leads in the final topic, which was the GAC DNS abuse um, updates from the GNSO Council. These are, um, this was an update about what comes next. So the amendments to the RA are effective in April. Um, DNS abuse was defined for the broader GAC community, especially with regards to new members, uh, which will go into that the DNS abuse definition in a, in a later slide, um, and then introduced domain metrica, which is formerly known as the DAAR, uh, which is a utility for registrars and registries to share data regarding um, DNS abuse. Next slide, please. Great, WSIS plus 20 update, one of the hotter topics at ICANN 79, really, um, this will be a theme throughout the rest of the year. So, <clears throat> excuse me, just a little bit of a background on WSIS plus 20. This is a review of the World Summit on Internet Society Summit, if you will, that was uh, held in 2004 and 2005, uh, which set the precedent for how internet governance has been handled for the past two decades. So this review is looking back at where the mistakes were made, what needs to be improved, um, how the internet can go forward with, gov with regards to governance um, throughout the next two decades. Um, so with the with kind of the background outline, let's talk about what's coming next. So the UN, the United Nations, will convene in 2024 to um, to create a pact for the future, which uh, is a, seems like a title for for a movie or a book. But the pact for the future is the <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, are the plans that um, they hope to achieve at the WSIS Plus 20 review, which will be held in May May 26th through the 30th of 2025. Um, it's interesting to note that with the UN taking a broader impact in the review process, there's going to be greater interest and larger participations from other governmental agencies um, than, was, than was in 2004 and 2005, and even in the WSIS Plus 10 review in December 2015. Um, ICANN wants to continually express its support for the multi-stakeholder model. We want that, the ICANN community wants that model to continue. This is reflected in support from the CCNSO councils, GAC, and GNSO. Um, there is concern, though, felt throughout the ICANN community and something to be aware of. Is internet governance as we know it in jeopardy after 2025's World Summit of Internet Society? Um, will things change? Will ICANN continue to be ICANN? Will bigger governments take a more, you know, more involved role in how the internet functions? Um, all things to be to be coming in the next year. Um, there's never there's never a day off, if you will. Um, the question from the community was, you know, should I can take a bolder stance during the review? Should they should they defend themselves, if you will? Um, and there is concern over ICANN's coordination, which if we move into the next slide, we'll kind of discuss the coordination from the ICANN side. Um, ICANN's created the WSIS Plus 20 Outreach Network. This is a network of it's a great picture of me intently working. A network for the exchange of information um, related to the review process, coordination between various stakeholders and groups within the ICANN community, um, and other interested parties with shared goals. If you'd like to you know, be up to date, you can sign up for their newsletters that are sent out. Um, this outreach network is very important for the coordination, again, of the ICANN community to make sure that everybody is in line with where they want to see the WSIS Plus 20 review go and, and what involvement they'd like. But it is to be noted that this is a communication platform and not a working group. Nothing will be set in stone from this. It's just purely to share information um, and coordinate with regards to what's what updates have happened. And with that, I believe I turn it over to Prudence to discuss the DNS abuse amendments. Thank you so much, Shane. And what a fantastic picture of you and Phil Buckingham together. Cute. Um, okay, so let's talk about the DNS abuse amendments. And let's take a step back because 
Shane's kind of highlighted something that kind of underpins the whole kind of inner machinations and working of ICANN, and that is the multi-stakeholder model. And what it means is that sometimes things take a very long time to happen because there are so many distinct elements that do have a voice and have a say in order for that multi-stakeholder model to work. However, if you want an example of the multi-stakeholder model at its finest, take no further look than here at the DNS abuse amendments, because when you look at what's happened here, a specific contingent of the community came together and identified an issue, i.e. there wasn't enough concrete obligations to act for certain registrars and registries with regards to DNS abuse, and they took it upon themselves to create contractual obligations to take care and take action with regards to DNS abuse. What does this mean? It means that essentially we changed our own contracts with ICANN to give ourselves more work. Why did we do that? Because DNS abuse is important and something that is at the forefront of what we do and something that as contracting parties with ICANN we all take really seriously. So if you ever really want an example of how multi-stakeholder models can work and actually really benefit the broader community at large, this is one of those examples, and it is a shining example of what we can do when we all work together. Uh, that being said, yes, as a registrar, we have more work. Hurrah. So let's talk about what that means and what that means for you um, and also, you know, actions that you need to take. So essentially, in order to understand how the new amendments work, it's really good to understand where and when they work and how to qualify for them. So, for example, the definition now has been very clearly set as to what constitutes DNS abuse, and it is the technical definition. So, as you can see from the slide, you're not seeing anything to do with trademark infringement, you're not seeing anything to do with uh, domain disputes or, you know, domain names replicating IP. It's very specifically stated here, malware, botnets, phishing, farming and spam specifically in the circumstances where it's being used as a delivery mechanism for other forms of DNS abuse. Now, that being said, we've kind of quantified what DNS abuse is. More importantly, and this is something that's very important for everyone who's listening today, in order for you to make registrars act, and now there is a contractual obligation for registrars and registries to take action, you need to provide something that's called actionable evidence. So what that actually means is that we have to go a little bit further than just writing in an email, we don't like this because it's bad and it's mean, but you need to actually support and provide documentation in support of those, these contentions that you're putting forward and asserting. Now, we're a corporate registrar, so we don't really receive DNS abuse complaints very often at all. But when we do, some of them aren't necessarily worded in the most useful way that will help us act. And one of the reasons why actionable evidence is so fundamental is it really makes sure that registrars know what they need to do, where they need to investigate, and it really helps us resolve matters as quickly as possible. So let's have a look and see about what actionable evidence can look like for you or for me as a registrar. So uh, let's go to that next slide. Okay, so for example, if we're looking at phishing, try and give a screenshot with regards to any emails that you've received or kind of show, and in that email, try and make sure that you can show a header uh, of that kind. So we're literally just talking about making sure that you have any type of documentation that can support it. Um, with your supporting like something like malware, if you can provide any evidence uh, of the distribution of malware and what that looks like, uh, same with regards to if you're asserting that it's a subdomain, specify what the subdomain is, and if you can show that and demonstrate that in its use, perfect, that's really great. If you're citing that it's, an, it's fraudulent and it's an impersonation, Please provide like what it should look like and what it is that you're actually seeing. All of this evidence really makes sure that you make sure that registrars can act uh, and that they can take action. Um, however, another thing to please bear in mind, the DNS abuse amendments, sure, they create obligations for registrars to act. However, there's no standard 
like standardized way for the notifications to be sent. So registrars still have discretion as to what mechanism or what their process flow is for how you notify them of DNS abuse. So they can either have a web form or they can have an email. Uh, at the moment we use email. We may or may not be going to a web form, um, but ultimately if you are going to be using a web form it's so important that you follow the instructions of that web form, you categorise the DNS abuse in accordance to that web form correctly and you really minimise scope uh, to make sure that there's no reason to act. So always make sure that you attach your actionable evidence. And if you are a Mark Monitor client, which I'm presuming most of you on the call today are, if you are confused and you need assistance, you're not sure if this looks right, reach out to your DPA, reach out to your team, we will help you navigate this minefield um, of new obligations because we want to support you in this process and we want to make sure that when you send your complaint once that you stick the landing and also as well we actually know a guy who knows a guy so sometimes if you send something and you're not sure if it's landed let us know so we can reach out and check in for you and see if we can help you out um, this is exactly one of the things that we love to do so lean on us and help us and let us help you with regards to navigating through uh, this these brand new world and landscape. Um, but yes, ultimately, with regards to the DNS abuse amendments, it's a real shining example of how contracted parties came together to identify an issue and really try and work to fix it. Is it going to solve all DNS abuse? Unfortunately, no. People do bad things all of the time. That's just the way the world works. But however, this is a really positive step in the right direction. And as I've said before, if you do want a support and assistance as to how you navigate through that, please feel free to reach out uh, to any member of your Mark Monitor team and we'll help out wherever we can. Okay, so with regards to next steps, with regards to the DNS abuse amendments, um, we'll, be, we'll be looking at an effective date of the 5th of April, um, but there's going to be a whole bunch of swathe of education processes for the contracting parties, making sure that everyone knows and understands their obligations, um, but also as well, there'll be education pieces making sure that the public understands about what actionable evidence is to really maximise the likelihood of success when you do lodge and file a complaint. Okay, so less about DNS abuse, even though it's really, really exciting. Let's get back to the GAC, or return of the GAC, can I say? <laughs> Thanks, Chris, it's all yours. All right, well, with that intro like that, how can we go wrong? Um, I did want to inject one moment of levity as I was thinking about this, that one of the ICANN selected hotels on, um, on the, in, in San Juan that was self-proclaimed as the originator of the pina colada cocktail so at the end of this slide i will let you trivia bust have 45 seconds or a minute to look that up and then we'll tell you who that is anyway all right with that exciting lead-in um the gac is the governmental advisory committee and they had a big week at ICANN in ICANN 79 79 71 members and nine observers attended um the week kicked off with a bang with um in the welcoming ceremony the former gac chair Man manal ismail of egypt won the ICANN community excellence award for 2024 for all her service of the last number of years so that was a, that was a great start to the week um the current GAC chair, Nicholas Caballero of Paraguay, he hit his first year of service in the GAC chair role during this meeting and um, his you know, leadership that GAC is changing a number of some of their practices, small and, and large. Um, since 2020, the GAC has had a lot more historical turnover than it had previously. Um, for instance, in this year, there's 32 new members. So because of that, the GAC is sort of always on a perpetual learning um, curve. Traditionally, they would do this through what they would call capacity building, and usually that would start in a workshop that, that set the stage prior to the actual meeting. This year, they pivoted and changed to have capacity building sessions throughout the meeting um, to get the members up to speed. Um, other issues that they kind of were experimenting with was an experimental open mic session with the community. Um, in this particular case, you know, not a ton of people actually commented, but it ended up being a way that the GAC members could sort of interact and share information with each other about different meetings that were going to happen throughout the year. So that was a real positive experience. Um, the GAC's also talking about 
potentially using a CRM um, platform to potentially track issues that they're, you know, working on and coming on, things like that to sort of, you know, enter the 21st century, if you will. Um, and the GAC was also looking at, you know, performing some additional things that maybe they hadn't traditionally done, getting outside the room that they're in for, you know, four or five, six straight days, doing team building, trying to work together so that, you know, the GAC members can learn more about each other and work together better. Um, next slide. So um, the kind of the summation of the work that's done in every one of the three annual um, public meetings for the GAC is what's called the GAC Communique. This is, you know, a document they produce at the end of every meeting. Um, the San Juan Communique came out this past Monday, March 11th. Um, and it describes sort of the issues that the GAC focused on throughout the, the, the sessions. Um, generally, the most important part of the communique is what is called the GAC advice, which it gives advice to the ICANN board. In this particular meeting, they focused on two areas of advice. Um, one is the applicant support program. We're going to talk about this in depth more in a moment, but this refers to the, the new GTLD program. Um, it was in place in the 2020, sorry, the 2012 application window, and it, and it will be in place going forward in the expected current application window of 2026. You know, the notion is that um, entities who maybe don't have the right amount of resources, you know, financial or otherwise, will can be able to sort of apply for this program and get assistance in um, doing applications for their own GTLDs. The GAC focused on some issues around this, such as, you know, global diversification. They really want to hit that underserved regions and countries, you know, to make sure that those countries are aware of the options they have. And that's tied into this, you know, overarching communications and outreach strategy that ICANN's, you know, completing and executing as part of the, the next round. Um, regarding budget, you know, the GAC wanted to really make sure that the ICANN board would have enough um, funds in place to help the parties who did apply. So for instance, you know, some of their thought process was if the application fees have increased over 30% for this next round, you know, the, the, the amount of budget in place for the applicant support program should also increase by commensurate 30, 30%. So things like that. And then other issues around support, you know, perhaps reductions of fees for the next few years, the ability for applicants who could do qualify for the applicant support to maybe provide their own back-end registry operator services and, and things of that nature. Um, regarding the second issue, the urgent request for disclosure registration data, um, the ICANN sort of, it sounds like based on this, this is an issue that had been discussed previously and sort of the work has vaguely been stopped in August of 2023. So the GAC wants the community to retake that up and they really want to focus on these issues where there's an immediate threat to life, serious bodily injury, critical infrastructure, or child exploitation. So, you know, the, the GAC and wants the community to take these really important issues very seriously and work together on figuring out, you know, timelines of the policies and how those things can be responded to. So these are the two areas of focus in this meeting, and we'll keep you posted on other things of how these, you know, GAC activities res result in effect in ICANN policy. Next slide. Oh, sorry. So the answer to that question, my trivia question was the Caribe Hilton was identified itself as the originator of the first pina colada cocktail. So you can use that to win your next trivia club. And with that, Prudence can talk about the red dress. Thanks, Chris. So the Caribe Hilton. Okay, good times. Um, <laughs> Great interjection there. Um, and yes, pina coladas are definitely a thing in Puerto Rico. That is that is a thing. Um, okay, so uh, who would have thought the, the GAC uh, could be so distracting that you'd forgot to tell the end of your trivia quiz? Um, so the reason why we always talk about GAC is because GAC advice uh, can actually lead to changing of policy making, right? It, it genuinely impacts policies and decisions that are made at ICANN level. So we focus on GAC uh, advices and GAC communiques, so you have visibility as to the things that they're potentially going to be impacting and talking about down the line. Because we've seen it time and time again, uh, especially with the next round coming up, there's going to be some really exciting conversations from the GAC. And during the ICANN meeting, I'm completely not talking about web dress, but this was fascinating. This ICANN meeting, again, was really about the different elements and different communities working together to speak with one 
one another and liaise and, and like inform each other with various things. So the GAC have a GMSO council liaison and that person has been doing a really fantastic job with making sure that the GAC is kept up to speed with things and that they are kind of conveying what's going on at council with uh, the GAC as well. But also the RRSG and the contracting parties spent a lot of time working with the GAC to keep them up to speed as to what is going on and what is impacting them. So if you can imagine, the GAC is comprised of governmental representatives. Their day-to-day -day job aren't necessarily anything to do with hosting or domain names they work in government. So a lot of the time, and also there's a huge turnover, as Chris pointed out. So a lot of the times, you know, you're looking at having to educate people who don't necessarily have a primary function to do with domains, who have an interest and obviously do want to participate, but who may not be there in a year or two. So it's a very challenging but interesting role, but especially seeing their communique and their feedback can actually impact the direction of policy development uh, as all part of the funds and joys of that multi-stakeholder model. Um, okay, redress, we have to talk about it. And I can't not mention RDRS without talking about a little bit of spice uh, that's happening. But instead of me going into what went down uh, in Puerto Rico and ICANN 79 to do the spice, what I will do is just take the time to speak to everyone here and reiterate what RDRS is and what it isn't and then hopefully have a discussion with you all to make sure that we're avoiding the pitfalls that many have suffered upon so far. So RDRS is the experimental disclosure request service for domain data. Now the name as it suggests it's about the, the request right, it's a request service. It, the disclosure element and the discretion as to whether the data is disclosed remains at the registrar level. But what that means is that it's a unified standardized system to make a request. Uh, now, what we've noticed is that people seem to be a little bit possibly conflating issues as to what it can and can't do. Uh, and people are also necessarily, or maybe not necessarily, maybe unnecessarily, uh, conflating the ability to get the data that they require with the success and the viability of the request system itself. Uh, now, so just to remind everyone, the standardized request system, which is what RDRS is, in order to make sure that you really are utilizing it to the best and fullest extent, and to make sure that your requests are successful, please make sure that you understand a couple of elements, just a couple of, couple of things. Firstly, it's not to do with privacy proxy. So if your domain is privacy proxy, you can't really use RDRS to get the access to that data. If it's redacted data, yes. If it's privacy proxy data, not so much. Uh, however, also as well, if the data underneath the privacy proxy, oh no, if the data underneath the redaction is privacy proxy, which could potentially happen, then again, that's the data that's underneath. So there's not really, that's the data that you're going to be receiving. That doesn't necessarily mean that the request service doesn't work it just means it didn't give you the data that you are requesting which is a slightly different matter i'm not saying it's right or wrong it's just the nature of the system another thing to bear in mind is that a denial is still a response so if you aren't receiving the request that you wanted or you're not receiving the data that you wanted the response that you've received the denial of re request is actually a response it's not an it's not that your response has not been received or was replied to again it's just been denied now in order to make sure that you are really minimizing your scope to have a denial it's really important that when you are submitting your requests through rdrs that you are categorizing them correctly. Uh, one of the biggest things that we've noted at the moment, or one of the biggest things that registrars have fed back during the ICANN 79 meeting was miscategorization, where people who are from law enforcement are not necessarily identifying themselves correctly, and people who are IP or are identifying themselves as law enforcement. And these things can lead to rejections, uh, because again, it's not your request isn't being categorized and funneled in the right way. So it's just little things like that that can make a huge, huge difference. Um, but also, just so you know, you know, 
if you are wanting to receive assistance using our DRS and you are a Mark 102 customer, let us know. We can help you. We're happy to kind of hold your hand through this process. It's what we do and what we're good at. And we can try and we know a guy who knows a guy, so we'll always try and help out where we can. Um, so to give you some statistics, as you can see from the side, we have quite a lot of requesters, right? Over 2,000 requesters in total. But so far, because our DRS is opt-in, we're looking at a total of around 75 registrars. So tell your friends who have registrars, tell your registrars who know registrars, please get everyone else to sign up to our DRS because the success of our DRS will result in the creation of a standardized access disclosure system or SAD type of system being created. If we don't collate enough data that substantiates that there are issues with accessing stuff with the who is, then we're not going to have anything created and things will just be left as they are. So it's really important that we get as many data requests and as many people on board providing the data and collecting the data as possible and i believe we're going to be doing this now until 2025 i think um, so there is a, a period of time that we're going to be using the rdrs system to get as much data as possible so please do make sure that you are using the system uh, that you are making requests through the system and submitting your data for the system and if you for whatever reason i'm not passing judgment if you do work with other registrars, it's okay. But can you please get them to sign up to RDRS as well, please? That's what I'm going to say about that. I mean, it's your choice, but please make sure they sign up too. Um, so we we really need to get the numbers up, and we really need to make sure that when you are submitting, that you are following and categorising correctly. I mean, from both sides, from the requester side and from the registrar side, like it is a bit of a clunky system, and there's scope for work, but ultimately we do want this pilot to be successful or uh, this experiment which was the, the terminology that was really banded around in the last meeting uh, we do want this to work so let's all work together and collaborate on this to make this happen um, but yes we've had 510 requests in total I'm not going to say that the vast majority of those requests were approved because um, not very many were because there's a lot of scope for people to utilize the system better. And also as well, guys, just to remind everyone, and I know it sounds like I'm just, you know, preaching to the choir, but if you have an IP related request, please don't use our DRS. That's not what it's for. So just to remind everyone, if you are complaining about like a trademark infringement or something of that nature, this is not what RDRS is necessarily related to. So just throwing that out there. Um, and anyway, less about RDRS. Um, if you do want help utilizing the system, let us know. Uh, we're happy to engage with you on that. Let's talk about all things registration data policy. Let's go to the next slide. What you're looking at here is a timeline. We have a registered data policy timeline, and we're looking at the 21st of August, 2025, for the policy to take effect. Um, now, the registered data policy, the reason why it's so exciting and why everyone's kind of talking about it, is it's creating essentially a way in which we collate our registered data and data flows between registrar and from registrant to registrar and registrar to registry. Um, so it makes sure that we're collecting uh, various types of registered data and how we collect that data and how we display that data as well. So it's all very exciting. And we've been working on this now for a considerable time. But where we are right now at this exact moment is we're at the policy publication and implementation phase. Uh, where we've been doing a lot of education pieces and during the Registrar Constituency Day, which was action-packed, um, we did have a really, really good session talking about the various elements um, of uh, registrant data and what we need to collect and when we need to collect it and the difference between must, may as well, because that becomes into play. But let's go to the next slide and I can show you a little bit more about what I mean by must and may. So I'm not going to do a deep dive into this because I know for everyone who's on the call today, this isn't necessarily the most exciting thing for you to kind of look at. Me, I look at this, I get excited. I need to get out more. I know, I know. Um, but, <laughs> but then when you're looking at this, look at the musts. Um, for most of our clients, they're multinational corporations. So it will be looking at things such, such as the organization field, the name field, 
and the address information. But this has been a really exciting time to see about how we collect our registrant data, what we display and, and how we display it. Um, we can do a bit more of a deep dive about this at another time, but I know we are slightly pressed for time. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to suggest that we do is go to our next slide, which is to do with the applicant support handbook. Uh, over to you, Chris. All right. Um, so yeah, I referred to this a few minutes ago. So the applicant support idea is this notion that, you know, as part of a next round, an applicant can apply for like their own TLD. But the thing is, is in order to do so, they might need assistance with resources to do so. So before they apply for a TLD, they're going to apply for applicant support for themselves as an entity. So they're sort of two separate ideas that are going to flow into the same notion. Um, so right now, the applicant support handbook is a draft of this um, um it was like the rules of how this applicant support process is going to work you know it's going to be important in the next round again it's going to show the various deadlines criteria processes and so forth um that these entities who do you know who might otherwise not be able to apply you know for either financial reasons you know maybe they don't have the labor internal you know people to, to do the work it, it'll give them a you know a hand up to continue to to make the, you know an, an application for a TLD in question, and the support itself won't necessarily only be limited to financial resources. It might be things like you know access to service providers who can assist them, counselors, training processes, and you know maybe down the road other fees. Um, next slide. So why is this important now? So even though you know everybody in the community is still kind of working off this the application window for new GTLDs is going to open in uh, the second quarter of 2026. You know, there are certain activities that have to happen before then in order for that to take off. One of them is this applicant support program. So the current vision of it is that it will run for 12 months, this period where an, app, where a, a, an applicant can apply for the support. And that would start as late as, sorry, as recently as Q4 of this year. And then that would go into roughly Q4 of next year and it would need to end six months prior to the actual application window for TLDs would open. Um, you know, the, the thing about this is that it's going to be, again, applica applicants applying to confirm whether they as an applicant meets the requirements to get the support. So again, it's not tied to anything. It doesn't matter what TLD they're applying for. So the string that the string of string of strings they're considering is never disclosed. Um, and as well as, they are not they're they will only able to go to this process one time and if you know the results aren't what they want they don't get a second bite of the apple or bite of the cherry depending on which country you're in. anyway so it's an important thing you know we're waiting to get feedback on it the feedback period is open sorry the public comment period is open until april 2nd so you know if that's something that you feel strongly about get your comments in and you know let i can and, and the community know you know how you feel about this but this is another important part of the um next round preparations next slide and it looks like back to you prudence okay um but before i dive into the transfer pdp update um if you are really feeling passionate about making a comment relating uh, to the applicant support guidebook please do let us know if you want some help writing that or drafting that again i can't stress enough we are a part of your team and happy to consult with you and support you through whatever it is that you choose to do. Um, what are the things that you know I'm going to do? Because we don't do these webinars without asking you to do something in return. We always want you to attend an ICANN with us. Uh, it's not just an excuse for me to feed you, which I will. Um, it's also an excuse for you to actually meet and get involved and engaged in ICANN. We get excited about ICANN so you don't have to, but ultimately we do want you to at some point get as excited about this as we are and we are happy to represent you at ICANN meetings but also as well we do want to make sure that you if you do want to engage you can engage and you feel confident to do so anyway transfer pdp updates i'm just going to whiz through this um, we had a really great session during ICANN 79 i'm not saying that this was the best pdp group ever and that we did everything and it was because i was on there but maybe maybe it was i'm just saying um, anyway, uh, we had a really good recap session during the ICAM 79 meeting where we discussed where we are, where we've come from and hopefully where we're going to go to. So on this slide, you can see basically all of the good stuff about where we've got to. 
one thing that I just want to let you know and just reiterate, we have got rid of some things. And uh, I managed to get what, we're 45 minutes in without mentioning the four dreaded letters of GDPR. GDPR kicked all of this off. GDPR is going to keep kicking things off. It's, it's, you know, it's not going anywhere. But because of GDPR, we have no longer a gaining FOA or form of authorization requirement. Instead, what we've decided to do is a series of notices that will be sent from the registrar, and then we have opt-outs potentially as well um, that will be kind of available to you. But as a result of this, we're really trying to find ways to make the transfer process and the change of registrant process as efficient as possible and as lean as possible. And it's been a really great opportunity for all of the different communities and different members uh, of the community to come together to figure out how to make this work as a group. So this has been a really fantastic PDP. Um, but as you can see from the slide here, you know, we do have a number of notices that are going out um, as opposed to using the FOA form. Um, and also as well, um, we are reducing the, the period of time that we are implementing locks when they are being implemented, which again is pretty exciting stuff. So in theory, we're making things a lot smoother um, and we should be, and we're working really well to time as well. I think we're actually supposed to be finishing the PDP in February next year, like it's 2025, it's soon, it's, it's, it's closer than what we realised. So. Uh, bravo to everyone who's been in the PDP. Um, it's really, it's going really, really well. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next slide where we'll talk about all things public interest committees or PICs and registry voluntary commitments. Over to you, Chris. All right. Um, all right. Well, if you will, let's take a quick uh, philosophical rabbit trail down into the ICANN policy wormhole. Um, so PICs and RBCs are an interesting uh idea that were brought up sort of in the 2020 2012 round um where the i can't sorry the gac provided advice and early warnings to applicants at that time based on what their strings were and if i can had maybe public interest um questions about if it's certain public good things along those lines so at the time applicants could in, interject their own public interest com comment uh, commitments or their registry voluntary commitments into their um, applications, which then were then injected into their actual registry agreements and then had long standing effects on, you know, how their TLDs were run. So they existed since then. Um, ICANN, since that point in 2016, ICANN's bylaws changed. ICANN has said that they're not able to um, manage or deal with things related to content. However, in late 2023, um, there was a framework that was uh, an implementation framework, which was suggested that would allow commitments for applicants to put on their TLDs, and then ICANN could potentially, you know, comment on their commitments on whether or not they could utilize them in the um, in, in their applications. So the the commitments could potentially be tied to content. So now it's like a chicken or the egg thing, it, you know can i can in, engage in addressing matters of content they don't want to be the content police you know so now it's become a sort of an issue in the community you know can they do this if they can can they do it under their current bylaws if they can't would they have to do a bylaw change you know we're sort of entering into you know undiscovered country type stuff where um you know the community is working through some of these issues so in um i can 79 there was a community um sorry, a community consultation where people sort of talked about some of these issues. They gave some examples. There were some potential TLDs that were talked about. Um, and then there were some stress tests and things that were discussed. So, you know, the, 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 the ICANN, the community working on last is, is continuing to receive commentary about this from the community um, and trying to decide how to move forward. So there's still work to be done, but this, you know, again, is one of those dependencies that will have effects on the next round going forward. So, you know, it's an interesting space to watch and we'll continue to pay attention and see what happens out of this. Next slide. All right. And then everyone's favorite evergreen subject at ICANN, which is universal acceptance. Shane talked about this a little bit earlier. So again, universal acceptance is purely the idea that all domains should work in all software applications. In reality, even in 2024, that doesn't happen all the time. So. You know, where that affects people is in, re in re regards to internationalized domain names, 
domains that are in languages or scripts outside of traditional, you know, the ASCII character set, things like Chinese, you know, Japanese, Russian, Russian, um, Arabic, and so forth. So, you know, when people, ICANN's efforts in, you know, launching the new GTLD program were mainly to try to get, you know, underrepresented parties across the global internet community to be able to use their local languages and things of that nature. So, you know, ICANN wants those domains to work. Um, as you can see, there's a number of CCTLDs now that utilize internationalized domain names, and there's also 90 new GTLDs. So, you know, we're making headway in that in that stretch. However, those are still not necessarily working in all things. You know, classic examples of, you know, utilization points would be email addresses. You know, a lot of places don't necessarily email service providers are still working on allowing IDNs and new GTLDs in email. Um, I believe recently ICANN itself is actually now able to receive emails and IDNs. And that was a small victory on their own side. Um, other issues around like linkification, there's been a recent example where the large, you know, global app WhatsApp was not successfully like linkifying um, domains that included new GTLDs. Apparently it came out there utilizing some um, tables and things of delegated domains from back in 2016 they've subsequently made changes to that and then those are going to get pushed out to the android operating system so anyway there's a number of different parties who can help in the ua area you know governments um the itf um you know the itu academic institutions the ICANN community there's a universal acceptance steering group inside of the ICANN community they're running events called ua days there's a number of those between the remaining days in march through march or sorry through may 1st um the largest one of them is going to be march 28th in serbia so you know we're continuing to see victories on the front but it's a long war and we'll continue to watch and see you know if we can get to the place where all domains will work in all applications and that's that next slide Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Um, so next steps, I guess, let's let's see. Let's get this community involved. Um, we've got different groups here, the intellectual property constituency, um, the business constitu constituency, um, and the brand registry group. Um, if you want to be involved, please look into these these groups and, and join us at ICANN. Find find what fits with the with your company, with your with your idea, with, with what you're passionate about. Um, next slide, please. Just want to touch on the next meeting is the policy forum in Kigali, Rwanda, held between um, the 10th and 13th of June. Should be a really exciting time. Kigali looks beautiful. They showed a wonderful um, presentation of Kigali while we were in San Juan, and it it looks wonderful. Should be an exciting exciting meeting. And to close out, I'll let um, Prudence kind of take over the thank you. But from me, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on our ICANN 79 recap webinar. We will be sending you a uh, questionnaire. We will also be hopeful that you'll join us in Kigali or in the AGM later on in Q4 this year. Um, help us to do an even better job representing you by directing us as to where you want us to be. And also as well, as we've consistently said throughout this webinar if there's anything that you want us to support you with or assist with just let us know um, we're always happy to be uh, of assistance um, in addition to ICANN we will be at INTO as well I know I'm not supposed to mention that but we'll be at INTO as well so if you do want to have a meeting with us at INTO you can join us there too uh, in Atlanta